All right, welcome everyone. I'm so glad you joined us for tonight's program, The Story of America Through the Lens of Labor History with our speaker, Larry Spivak. Um, I'm Wendy Babjack, the Adult Program Coordinator with the Tinley Park Library, and I have our Program and Outreach Services Manager with me, Pam Zukowski. So, Hello, everyone. Hi. Thanks thank for coming both. tonight. <laughs> yeah. Thank you both for being here. Um, I just want to go through a few other things before we begin. Um, we, we do have a Q&A uh, feature in this. If you want to enter any questions throughout, please go ahead and do that. And there's also a chat feature if you want to enter anything um, in that as well. So Larry will be addressing all those comments or questions at the end of tonight's program. Um, this meeting is, this program is being recorded. Uh, but no worries, while you can see us, we won't be able to see you in the, in the recording. And the recording will be available for one week. I will put that, a link to that uh, recording in your follow-up email. Um, and tonight, Larry, he's our speaker. He is the president of the Illinois Labor History Society. Um, he's here to tell, help us learn about the people and events that transformed America, American life and work. So please welcome Larry Spivak. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, some of you may have uh, been on last two weeks ago, and of course, we had a little technical glitch. So I hope I'm not, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, um, creating any bad vibe here by mentioning it, but I apologize. It was such a strange situation to have no problem with wireless, and then suddenly the internet just cut out for 45 minutes. Hopefully it uh, won't happen again this time. So I'm really happy that Tinley Park Library uh, said that they could do this again. And I hope that uh, you enjoy the next hour or so of our my talking about America through the lens of labor history. I should tell you a little bit about myself uh, first. Uh, I am president of the Illinois Labor History Society, but uh, long before that, uh, um, decades and decades ago, when I graduated, uh, I. I got a degree in education actually from Northern Illinois University and I became a public school teacher and I taught in the public schools for a short period but then got a teaching job teaching adolescents in a psychiatric program uh, teenagers uh, high school students at the Illinois State Psychiatric Institute and I was represented by the Union American Federation of State County Municipal Employees AFSCME and I became active in the union and saw the value of uh, be having representation in the workplace and understood, uh, began to really learn more about labor history and how all our lives have been positively affected by having uh, the right, the democratic right to have representation on the job and also the role that unions have played in social history and civil rights, uh, social economic justice, and the dynamic behind how that works. So I wanna share some of that with you today. Uh, the Illinois Labor History Society is a 50-year-old uh, uh, organization, now almost 51, and created in 1969 to help remember one of the most important events really in world history that very few Americans know about. And this is a theme that will run through the discussion tonight, which is all these very important events that are known throughout the world, or through, uh, but yet Americans have so, so little understanding or even knowledge of the events that took place. And um, I often say that when I do programs like this, what I hope that uh, people who are uh, in the audience are doing is are thinking, why is that? Why don't I know that? Why wasn't this taught? Maybe that'll come up in the questions and answers. And um, I make a lot of editorial comment anyway. I, this is my program, <laughs> but it's uh, it's actually um, this isn't a neutral. There, there are actually it's the old labor song. There are no neutrals there. Which side are you on? And there's a lot of that when we talk about uh, labor history, because labor history is about so many things. It's about all of us. It's about capital and labor which is really in us and them. There is cooperation and there's a need to cooperate, but there are adversarial interests at times. And this manifests itself in the workplace all the time when it comes to profit, when it comes to wages, when it comes to worker safety, when it comes to the livelihood of people versus those who make the money 
uh, owning of the, uh, of the company, if it's in the private sector. Um, it's the story of all of us. It's the story of gender. It's the story of immigration. It's the story of race. It's the story of industry. It is, it is really a way to tell our uh, human condition. Uh, certainly, uh, in this case, Illinois labor history, which is probably one people who study labor history would say Illinois is a special place. However, I'm not focused on Illinois. I'm focusing a little more on general labor history, but because Illinois is so important, there's a, a lot of stories that come from here, Illinois and Chicago in particular. Um, so I'm going to uh, get started uh, uh, through this slide presentation. And it uh, begins really when uh, settlers started coming to America, uh, coming and this is an interesting I, thing that so many people don't realize. When we talk about white people, uh, primarily Europeans, most of the people who came here who were workers came as indentured servants. Now, they were not slaves. They were able to work off their passage after seven years and then uh, begin a life. But uh, the typical person who came from Europe, uh, uh, England and uh, uh, Great Britain, um, in particular, in the early years of uh, this, you know, the 17th century, were coming as indentured servants. Um, it created a uh, right away a very harsh contrast for folks who were coming here as workers, feeling that they were slaves. But the story of America uh, would America would not exist in in its wealth and capacity if it wasn't for uh, slaves. And I mean that. Uh, it's not to support the idea of slavery, it's to say that slaves were the backbone of this economy, of this country, of the founding of this country, so much so that then we're talking about chattel slavery. We're talking about people who were forced over through the Middle Passage where uh, tens of millions died just on the Atlantic Ocean on the boats alone over the uh, generations that people were forced here to uh, be property of a handful of uh, slave owners. Um, but many of you may know this, that slaves uh, were instrumental in helping build the White House. Slaves helped build uh, the Capitol. Slaves uh, built so much of the beautiful ironwork and property of New Orleans that we enjoy today. Um, and it's just a tiny fraction of an example. And it cannot, we cannot talk about America we cannot talk about American history without, and slavery is about work without understanding that and the legacy that exists today. And uh, frankly, I think it's fantastic. Despite the conflict, uh, despite uh, the uh, social unrest, that these issues are beginning to be talked about in the public sphere in a way that they weren't. Uh, but that is a whole nother class and a whole nother discussion. And of course, I mentioned that uh, America is about uh, a country of immigrants. Uh, we're, it, if, uh, except for the native, uh, the indigenous people, the First Nation people who basically uh, um, had genocide committed on them, uh, this is a country of immigrants, a country of forced, uh, uh, forced immigrants and those who chose to come here to seek a better life. Uh, and it, of course, continues to be that story. That is the story of America. And the story of America and building its foundation is a story of all genders being in the workplace. It's often thought, oh, women didn't go to work until uh, the 1970s. I mean, there are people who actually think that. Um, but uh, early industrial America was, uh, uh, was much driven by women in the workplace. More uh, to the point of who this story of America is that children played a significant role. And part of telling this story and of, of America is that we have to understand that sometimes we take things for granted, um, don't even think about it. Um, and uh, as a people, we sometimes don't question why things were the way they were or are the way they are. And you know, there was a time when uh, parents sent their kids into the factories and mines because of course it was the only way to feed the family in addition because of the disparity of, uh, uh, of how much people were paid and what they created. 
and uh, owners of the uh, early industries uh, were happy to pay children almost nothing, certainly to have slavery, certainly to pay women less than men. And um, uh, think about the indignity of it, of children, eight, seven, eight-year-olds working in the mines and the factories 10, 12 hours a day. And I have one quick story. I think it was around 1835. And this is the idea that children actually had to look out for themselves because uh, there was a silt in, at a silt mill in um, uh, New Jersey. It was the children who walked out of that factory and demanded that children under the age of 12 didn't have to work more than 10 hours a day. And uh, that uh, they be, and without the children working, the uh, uh, textile owners wouldn't have made their money. So uh, these, this is a, a, a this is ongoing all the time throughout our history. So did we, do we now think it's okay for eight-year-olds to work in the factories? Well, of course not. The question is, we did at one point, at one point, many of us thought slavery was okay. At one point until 1920, we thought it was okay that women didn't have the right to vote. So I just bring this up to say, things don't have to be the way they were. They can change. And the question is, how do they change? And that's one of the things we talk about when we talk about labor history. I'm going to skip right to the Civil War because this is the period of great industrialization in America that's beginning. The railroads are beginning to uh, get uh, are laid down. Um, and one of the main things about living in Illinois, in Chicago in particular, is that we were the crossroads. We're the center of the country. But when Johnny came home from the Civil War in 1865, on one hand to end slavery, and on the other hand to uh, um, uh, unify a country that was divided, um, uh, let me back up for a second. Uh, Johnny came home and found that women were working, were working in the factories for uh, less than one half the wage and children for um, less than a third of the wage. So when they came back to work, the, the, the effect on the ability to feed their families was really difficult because wages had been depressed. As, it was, the, as industrialization was taking place, people were making a lot of money. Um, this gave rise to a whole new set of thinking. And here's an example of a person. I doubt that most of the viewers here, most of the participants in this know who this woman is. Um, but since we, I don't have an audience to talk uh, back and forth with, um, I'll just let you know that this is a great American. One of the greatest Americans, I believe, in our history that very few people know about. At one point, she was very well known. Her name is Lucy Parsons, and she was married to a man named Albert Parsons. This is Lucy Gonzalez Parsons, a woman born from slavery uh, and uh, moved to Texas and um, met a white ex-Confederate soldier of all people who he disavowed the idea of the South. He, he was progressive. He didn't like, he was a wealthy uh, Alabama. And, and uh, when he met Lucy in Texas, they fell in love in the, in the 1870s. Hard to believe. And it wasn't easy to live in Texas. But they started advocating for social change um, and being a uh, um, uh, biracial couple, it virtually, or, or a mix, uh, mixed race couple, white and black, virtually impossible to live in Texas, so they came to Chicago. The reason I mentioned Lucy is that Lucy, who was an activist, um, a great speaker, a great writer, great orator, uh, um, and a seamstress, um, she uh, gave the speech, and I'm going to just give a short uh, piece of it here. She said, when labor is no longer for sale, men and women will think free, act free, and be free. While slavery steals over us, passivity is a crime. She's talking about wage slavery because chattel slavery had ended. And so the term wage slavery became a term of art where people were saying, we're now wage slaves. We work 16 hours a day. We can't feed our families. That's not right. And so people began advocating for things like the eight-hour day. Um, and uh, there were eight-hour day laws passed, but they were never enforced. But the idea of wage slavery became a theme among many of the working classes uh, to end that indignity and that injustice. Because 
Uh, after all, what happens when you work 16 hours a day and can't feed your family, but the person uh, that uh, uh, owns the factory is, uh, in today's terms, a billionaire. So uh, it didn't make sense to uh, many people. And um, uh, so Lucy is one of those heroes. And uh, um, I uh, would love to uh, share more stories about her, but I hope you'll look her up, Lucy Parsons. And in fact, about three years ago, uh, the alderman uh, uh, over in uh, uh, the, um, uh, I just forgot the name of the neighborhood, but over at Kedzie, near just between Fullerton Belmont, named Lucy Gonzalez Parsons Way. Uh, that's me with two of my compatriots from the Illinois Labor History Society. In fact, the woman on the right, Alma Washington, uh, she plays uh, Lucy uh, Parsons. She's an actress and she's played her many, many times and, uh, over the years. But this period after the Civil War is amazing in America because railroads are growing. They're the primary and the biggest industry. And um, uh, there are constant depressions and uh, there are booms, boom and bust cycles in America. And um, uh, uh, one of the significant events that took place, it was 1877, the summer of 1877, uh, workers in the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad went on, just walked out, and uh, because of the uh, uh, oppression, the lack of the, their, the inability for them to feed their families for all intents and purposes. And the railroads at that time, these were the, the rich of the rich. These were the Jeff Bezos and the, uh, um, uh, well, you name whoever the rich of the rich are, you know, uh, a few of them, the billionaires and the the bazillion billionaire types. And uh, um, uh, they went on strike and the strike just spread quickly across the United States. And by 18, by the sum, by July of 1877, uh, there were pitched battles around the country. Uh, but in Chicago in particular, uh, there was an event that was called the Battle of the Viaduct because uh, it was very common. What would happen is when workers would go on strike, uh, private mil militia, uh, at this point, not so much the military, but private uh, militia and the local police were pretty much in the employ of the companies. And they would basically break the strikes by uh, uh, shooting and uh, killing people uh, protesting. And this happened in Chicago. And um, uh, uh, there's a uh, area, if you know Chicago, right where Pilsen, is separated from where the University of Illinois is at 16th Street. There's a viaduct, and that was called the Battle of the Viaduct. 66 workers were shot down. But this created two things. This created a more, what I would call a class consciousness for American working people. Uh, also at this time, many immigrants were coming from Europe who had a class consciousness and identified as workers. and. Uh, this wasn't the America today where people think of themselves, oh, we're middle class or we're upper class, or um, it was your working class, and that's almost everybody, or your the ruling class, and um, or the uh, agents of the ruling class. And um, it created two things. There, this uprising was probably the closest thing to a workers' revolution, and at the same time, uh, really freaked out the ruling class. And so this became the reason that we have national guards and armories and private militia. So when you think about Pinkertons and you think about, oh, you know, protecting uh, uh, the bank vault, it was really about protecting uh, the wealthy from the working class. And this is now the story of America. And um, it turns out that after the Chicago fire, uh, corporations were using the, uh, charity money is interest-free loans and people would protest. And so it, there really was a dynamic of us and them at that time. Um, the steam engine uh, industrial processes are uh, creating uh, huge factories and immigrants are coming in to work at low wages. And people are saying, this is a problem that we don't have, uh, again, it's a, we can't feed our families. And, 
unions uh, that were small crafts began organizing. And one of the largest organizations that eventually had 700,000 members was called the Knights of Labor. And they advocated for the eight hour day as everybody else did. But uh, there were different organizations and the Knights of Labor were interesting because they wanted to take more of a political view as opposed to a bargaining view to change society. Uh, but um, uh, uh, so there were differences even among the working classes, uh, the organizations of the working classes at that time. This, of course, you know, in the 1880s, uh, when France gave us, gifted us the Statue of Liberty, people were coming here looking at that inscription, which we look at today, bring me your tired, bring me your poor, bring me your huddled masses. That's people were coming here with the promise that this would be a better place than the difficulty they had where they lived in Europe, if they were uh, European immigrants, only to find that in fact, they were being living in tenements and working ridiculously long hours. And so the myth wasn't always what it was, uh, what people had hoped it would be, the stories of coming to America and you would get rich. Certainly that existed, but it was always a very small minority of people. But uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, one of the interesting uh, dynamics of this time in immigration were the German immigrants. And now I'm gonna focus more on Chicago. Uh, this is August Spies and he was, uh, um, uh, I had mentioned Lucy Parsons, this is August Spies, and I'll be mentioning a few others. Um, Lucy Parsons, of course, was born in America. She's an, uh, and Albert Parsons was as well. But um, it, uh, uh, there were, in 1884, uh, a group that then became the American Federation of Labor called for all Americans to be on strike by May 1st of 1886. And uh, people like August Spies, who wrote a German language newspaper in Chicago, Albert Parsons, were two of the preeminent uh, writers, orators, and union organizers, and fighting for the eight-hour day. Now, here's the question for all of you. Why would the idea of an eight-hour day be so scary to the ruling class? What's wrong with the eight-hour day? It's just, isn't it? I mean, we people... We're working 14, 16 hours a day. So when people called for the eight hour day, and maybe we can talk about this in question and answer, what did this mean? Well, what it meant was people said, you pay me this for this uh, time of the 16 hours that I'm working now, but I only work eight hours. What does that do? Well, it cuts into profits. And so like always, as always is the case, it's always about profits. And whenever you challenge profits, you challenge the status quo of the ruling class and the ruling class doesn't like that. And so that's why they have armories and military and paramilitary and try to break every strike where people are trying to raise wages. This is just simply the history. This is objective history. This is my interpretation of it. Um, but uh, having said that, uh, these gentlemen, uh, along with several others, uh, advocated for this idea and um, of the eight hour day uh, and um, by May 1st of 1886, 350,000 workers in America were on strike. There were strikes all over. In Chicago, 10,000 workers won the eight hour day by uh, May 1st because they had struck 80,000 workers in Chicago were on strike. And this is the McCormick Reaper plant uh, where uh, large uh, um, agricultural implement uh, machines are made and they were on strike and August Spies went to speak to workers over there and the police came and just started shooting and killed workers and he went back and wrote an article and other workers went back to the city a bit downtown and organized uh, a protest. It was finally had come to the point where we cannot tolerate every time we are on strike uh, and it had been peaceful or uh, 80,000 people marched up Michigan Avenue on May 1st of 1886. Um, why are you coming and shooting us when we're on the picket line? And so a protest rally was planned for, uh, this is now, uh, this, uh, this event, this tragedy of uh, the shooting down workers at the McCormick Reaper plant was on May 3rd. So on the night of May 3rd, uh, people, uh, August Spies, who was a printer, uh, had his assistant prepare a flyer. Now there's two flyers here. 
One flyer on the right is the flyer uh, that uh, got distributed. The flyer on the left, uh, you'll see where I just circled it. It says, working men, arm yourselves and appear in full force. That flyer was not distributed. That flyer, though, uh, became significant as evidence against uh, who became known as the Haymarket Martyrs, uh, saying that they were compelling violence and a conspiracy to commit murder. Um, August Spee said to Adolf Fisher, his assistant, uh, rewrite this. We're not putting this out that says working men arm yourselves and appear in full force, although that was the feeling that people wanted. So the flyer on the right was the one that was distributed. But in history books, and this goes again to the question of how we know, some of you may know of the Haymarket tragedy, the Haymarket affair. Most people call it the Haymarket riot, but, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our organization. We always say it wasn't a riot, it, it, it was a tragedy. Um, it's called a riot because people think of a riot that people are just uh, uh, acting in, in code, um, acting violently when in fact, the only riot was uh, uh, the police. But that's a, uh, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll tell just a little bit more of the Haymarket story. Um, so on May 4th in Haymarket Square, which if you know Chicago, just west of the river at Randolph and Des Plaines, there's an area that was wider and people could gather together. It was really a feeding area for the, a watering area for the horses. And, um, uh, the hope was that 20,000 people would come to protest police brutality and the fight and uh, to the fight for the fight for the against the fight for the eight hour day. And only 2,500 people showed up on a miserable evening of May 4th, 1886. However, 176 police officers were there and um, the mayor was there, but the mayor saw that the rally was peaceful. So he told them to go home, but they didn't. They were in the employ again of the large corporations police were and the police commander, the inspector Bonfield in particular, and he commanded his people to stop, stay. At the last speaker of that night was Samuel Fielden, one of the only others of this group of Haymarket Martyrs, who was he was born in Lancashire, England. He was giving the final speech, and um, just as he was talking, um, the inspector Bonfield moved in on the 250 people that were left in the uh, crowd and said, I command you in the name of the people to disperse. Samuel Fielden, this illustration of the man on the hay wagon says, but this is a peaceable meeting. And at that very moment, uh, dynamite uh, encased bomb, rather uh, uh, a, an iron sphere containing dynamite with a fuse was thrown Nobody knows who threw it from behind a vestibule and into the crowd, right at the foot of the police. One policeman died instantly and the workers were not armed, but all the illustrations of that period, the newspapers and magazines were um, owned by corporations, of course, were intent on saying that these were anarchists who were uh, trying to take over society, excuse me, take over society. The, uh, um, and uh, change life as we would know it. Well, when we say change life as we would know it, that would be like an eight hour day, you know, a more hospital place to work. But um, uh, this was of course the bomb that changed the world. And it changed the world because of the events that ensued right after. Um, uh, the uh, um, uh, martial law was declared uh, and the, the uh, state, uh, the, pro the uh, judiciary uh, decided to find eight men that they could put up on charges. They didn't have any evidence that anybody there, anybody involved in the protest through the bomb or even was involved in organizing anything like that. So eventually a trial was, uh, uh, the Haymarket trial, uh, uh, bringing eight men, six of them German immigrants. And I mentioned Germans again because at the time, of Chicago, in Chicago in the 1880s, one out of three uh, Chicagoans were German speaking, were from Germany or German speaking. And uh, just like today, you know, you think about it, the dynamic is Chicago now is one third um, Latin, Latinx, you know, uh, Spanish is the one third of the language of Chicago. And the xenophobia and this fear of immigrants was very powerful. Germans were hated in Chicago by the uh, native born 
uh, people in many ways. Uh, it's a much bigger and complicated story, but uh, it was easy to create the face of the enemy by saying these German radical anarchists, socialist, uh, labor organizer, agitators were trying to uh, violently overthrow society. Certainly a lot of people felt like they wanted to do that, but the trial was so unfair. Um, it had no evidence and it was pomp and circumstance and it's, it's a story in itself. But um, even the state's attorney, Grinnell, Julius Grinnell, in the closing argument said, he did, because he didn't have evidence, he said to the jurors, he said to the jurors, pointing to the uh, um, defendants, these men are no, more, more, are no more guilty than the rest of you, but convict them for their ideas to keep our, idea, our society safe. That's the story of Haymarket. And that's why it became a cause celeb of workers around the world, because it became clear that the state, that cor the corporations, um, were interested in maintaining their uh, control, their economic control over working people through violence. And so at the end, um, four men, actually uh, seven men were convicted uh, to hang, um, uh, die by hanging. And uh, after their sentences, uh, af after their appeals, um, two had their sentences commuted, one got life in prison, one died in prison the night before the hanging, and these men, George Engel, Adolf Fisher, uh, August Spies, and Albert Parsons were hanged on November 10th, 1887. Um, the story is, uh, it, it should be a Hollywood movie. It's so incredible from the, uh, the events leading up to it, to the trial, and maybe one day there will be a Hollywood movie. Um, but, uh, uh, they're at their hanging they four men all were able to say something on um, two of them the most powerful words one was like what albert parsons said um let the voice of the people be heard and um at this monument in forest park uh, which i'll talk about briefly uh august peace said the day will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you are throttling today um, today, we have this beautiful monument that Lucy Parsons uh, uh, created uh, through an organization called the Pioneer Aid Support Association. It's in Forest Park, just west of Chicago, uh, and um, the Illinois Labor History Society is the deed holder of the world's most sacred labor site. From all around the world, people come to see that monument. And up until um, uh, 2004, there was nothing in Haymarket Square. People from all around the world would come and say, we heard about Haymarket because all around the world, uh, a holiday is celebrated because of this. Do you know what holiday that is? I'm listening. <laughs> May 1st, International Labor Day, celebrated by a couple billion people, billions of people every year. It's one of the most celebrated holidays. It's a day off everywhere in the world, right? Basically, except for the United States. It's Labor Day. So our Labor Day is the first Monday in September. But uh, the Illinois Labor History Society in 1969 said, we need to remember the events of Haymarket. It took 35 years to get a monument. And now we have plaques every year. We have a dedication of an international labor organization uh, dedicating a plaque. Uh, we've had plaques from, from New Zealand to uh, Canada, to Germany, to France, to Sweden, to Iraq, to um, Japan. Um, uh, Mexico, Colombia, and every year somebody else uh, organization comes and ded dedicates a plaque for the reason that May Day exists because in 1889 workers around the world got together and said let us celebrate the martyrs of Haymarket. We'll call it Lab International Labor Day. So all the people, some of you who are uh, grew up with the Cold War, think, oh, this is about a Russian communist holiday. This is the most American holiday that everybody in the world celebrates because of the events of Haymarket, those who died to fight for the eight-hour day and the right to organize. Um, I spent a lot of time on that, uh, 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 on that story, but it is so significant, and I do hope that uh, maybe you'll look more into it and what its effects and meaning are. It's gaining prominence again in the United States. And our organization, the Illinois Labor History Society, is the deed holder of the Haymarket Monument. Uh, we do a lot. Uh, we have a website. Uh, 
and uh, hopefully you'll go to IllinoisLaborHistory.org and check us out. But of course, uh, this was a setback for labor because the the trial created a, a scare. It was the first red scare, if you will, for American work uh, organized workers and workers trying to get uh, um, uh, representation. Uh, immigrants continue, of course, being part of Building of America. And um, this gentleman, Samuel Gompers, um, became the first president of the American Federation of Labor in 1886. And um, actually in 1893, those of you who know Chicago history know that the World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition was taking place. And Samuel Gompers was giving a talk at the steps of the Art Institute of Chicago. And uh, here's a shortened version of his speech. A reporter asked him, what does labor want? And he said, we want more schoolhouses and less jails, more books and less arsenals, more learning and less vice, more constant work and less crime, more leisure and less greed, more justice and less revenge. It was a uh, uh, um, very significant because this is now a new period of rising of labor because you have strikes taking place all around the country and uh, in Illinois, in Chicago, uh, there's a new uh, development. Um, Samuel Gompers, by the way, has a statue at Gompers Park over at Foster and <coughs> Pulaski. Um, that was dedicated uh, maybe about 10 years ago or so. Um, this man, another one of the most important people in American history, without doubt, uh, ran for president four times, but uh, started out as a railroad worker. And um, his name is Eugene Victor Debs. And he uh, born in Terre Haute, Indiana. And uh, he developed being the leader of the American Railway Workers Union. And he was in Chicago for his convention in 1894. And some of you may know about this, but um, there's an area of Chicago called Pullman. It used to be its own town, Pullman. In fact, last week on Labor Day, we were there for the, the groundbreaking of the visitor center because it's now going to be national. It's a national park, and they own 12 acres. And um, uh, the workers, because of the uh, that period of the, during that period of the World's Fair, George Pullman was trying to bring people to Pullman to see his beautiful city that he had built, uh, where he was building <coughs> the beautiful. Uh, they were Pullman Palace cars. These were uh, railroad cars that people could, sleeping cars. And it was a whole system where um, uh, 100,000 people at a given time would be on a Pullman Palace car somewhere in the, in the world. And um, the workers making the cars, of course, had to pay their, they lived in, they, they were born in a Pullman hospital. They went to Pullman school. They went to, to bought their food at the Pullman grocery store. Uh, and they had to pay their rents to Pullman and they could never make enough. And in 1894, with yet another depression, he cut their wages 25 to 50%. So the union there said, we should uh, work this out. And he wouldn't listen to them. Pullman was a revive, even among the wealthy, he was a, the billionaire of the day, along with Marshall Fields and um, uh, many of the others, the Swifts and the Armors and uh, the McCormicks. They didn't even like him, but uh, they supported him because uh, he was very powerful and he refused to budge. And so the workers walked out and Eugene Debs, uh, who ran the railway, who uh, led the railway workers union, supported the strike. By the way, this is how we don't tell history, but Eugene Debs and the 600 men of the railway workers union were convinced to support the strike because an 18 year old woman who worked in the factory came to their convention and made it, she implored them in this wonderful speech that uh, they, it was, they really needed to do this if they wanted to help all the Pullman workers. So Eugene Debs' union then said, we will strike all railroad cars in America that uh, pull a Pullman car and um, uh, shut down the railroad system. But because Pullman had friends in the U.S. government, uh, Grover Cleveland, uh, the Attorney General, uh, they sent in troops and they eventually put Eugene Debs in jail. So once again, the laws were turned on those of the working class 
and the strike fell through, but Eugene Debs emerged as a great leader. Um, and uh, again, this whole history of using violence against workers is a story of uh, uh, this conflict of how uh, um, uh, one reason it's always been so difficult uh, to take so long to uh, make the kind of progress we'd like to make. But then progress is made because people utilize what we sometimes refer to as collective action and solidarity. And this was an act of solidarity that scared the crap out of the ruling class. Um, but uh, Eugene Debs would eventually run on the Socialist Party ticket and in 1912 got almost a million votes. And he ran again in 1919 from jail as convict number 9653 because this was a, uh, he was convicted like so many labor uh, union, many people were thrown in jail. And if they weren't born in America, they were deported because they didn't support World War I. And the fact is, I don't know how well uh, many of you know your history, but World War I isn't World War II. It's not the same war. It's, uh, many people would argue it was an unjust war. It was a war of just dividing up the world. Nevertheless, it was a war, but it was very opposed in the United States and people went to jail for it. He got almost a million votes when he ran in 1919, but he was in prison uh, for that. And I like to tell the story of Eugene Debs because he represents a very important part of American history that most people don't know about. This is George Pullman. And today, this is the hotel that's being restored. But I want to uh, now move forward and talk about a few other important people that we wouldn't know about unless we focused in on things like labor history. Dr. Ellis Hamilton, uh, she was uh, a woman during that period in the early 1900s where she was studying the workers, the women workers of Pullman, and trying to figure out why they were getting sick. Um, well, it turned out that many of the women worked in the, uh, the, did the finishing work and they uh, would lick the paint brushes and the paint had lead in it and they were getting lead poisoning, but her work helped uh, create new methods, of, uh, new ways of looking at occupational safety and health. And um, people don't talk about her, but uh, she's fundamental if we want to understand safety and health in the workplace. Um, excuse me, wrong one. Uh, Jane Adams. Most people think Jane Adams is a woman who uh, just created the idea of social work. Jane Addams was really a woman who helped educate women workers uh, uh, at the Jane Addams Hull House, which is right there on Halstead Street in Chicago. Uh, she set, formed the settlement house with Mary McDowell to train women to become organizers, to become, uh, to learn English. And um, she was involved in uh, trying to get George Pullman to settle the Pullman strike. She was involved in the stockyard strike, trying to get the owners of the stockyards to settle uh, with, uh, to provide wage increases to our workers. And the reason I mention this is that when we tell labor history, we often, we don't think about these things of how these people were connected to labor and labor history. We talk about them in other ways, but uh, somehow uh, there's a reason that we don't know about the legacy of uh, people's real work. And um, I would just argue for you to think about and the question of why is that? I'm sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. It shouldn't be so hard, right? Um, and here's a woman. Now, all of you know this woman, right? She was called the most dangerous person in America. She was on the front pages of newspapers all the time, certainly between the per latter period, between 1900 and 1925, she was always in the news. Um, certainly that period between 1900 and 1915. Um, she was called the most dangerous woman in America, and it's not true, of course, but she was always being thrown in jail because she, when at the age of 60, born in Cork, Ireland, but eventually uh, moved to uh, uh, Chicago after all her children and husband died uh, in, um, uh, from uh, uh, yellow fever and, um, and, then a, and then a fire. And at the age of 60, she became a union organizer. She helped organize mine workers, but her real goal, her real uh, uh, legacy is much trying to end child labor. And, you know, the idea that children aren't in schools, but working in mines and factories. Mother Jones, when she would lift her hand 
workers would go on strike. That's what a judge said who was sentencing her to jail for the umpteenth time because she was always somewhere across America. Um, uh, uh, Mary Harris Jones was her name. Um, and uh, she led America to end child labor. Uh, these are the faces, of course, of what our history is. Our wealth exists because of children, because of slaves, because of low wages. This is her on a march to Theodore uh, Teddy Roosevelt's compound in uh, uh, Long Island, um, uh, a march of children to get him to stop child labor. Um, and this is in a mining camp. And uh, she was, uh, she's an uh, incredible spirit. Um, I'm gonna skip over some of this because of time, but in Southern Illinois, in Mount Olive, there is Mother Jones Monument at the Union Miner Cemetery. Um, because of another uh, mine um, strike in Verdon, Illinois, where uh, nine miners were killed um, by the company, she said that she wanted to be buried with her minor angels, and, um, the, uh, and the miners weren't allowed to be buried in Verdon because it was, again, like a company town. So the, union, the uh, United Mine Workers bought a cemetery just out on the Illinois side of uh, St. Louis. It's in Mount Olive. And uh, that's her uh, monument. People, you'll see the sign when you go down I-55 and you get as you get towards St. Louis. Um, it's a great place. Another interesting organization that very few Americans would know about is 1905. Um, a number of uh, uh, worker activist types decided to create a new kind of union. They said the problem with organizing people into little unions by their craft isn't changing the workplace. We should have one big union for all workers, and at very least, organize people on an industrial basis. That's something Eugene Debs did. So a bunch of people, including Mother Jones, including um, uh, Lucy Parsons, um, this fellow, Big Bill Haywood, was uh, their primary leader, um, uh, and others in Chicago in 1905 created the Industrial Workers of the World. Now, they got known as the Wobblies. That's a different story, how, why that is, but uh, so often people will talk about the IWW or the Wobblies. And they created a whole new vision of what a union could be, what changing, instead of some people felt like unions were stayed and they were just not paying attention to the bigger issues and they weren't really organizing enough. And this is in the early 1900s. And they created an excitement uh, to the working class. It, um, they became uh, very active in uh, out, especially out west, uh, in timber, in the western mines, in uh, paper industry. Um, but uh, the imagery and the iconography is quite interesting about who they were. And this is a part, again, that you probably won't get in normal history classes, but it's a significant part of our history. And this, of course, again, is a, an example of how the, um, uh, the, the ruling class, I sometimes use that term, uh, the wealthy, the industrialists, the elite, uh, um, were a little bit uh, uh, nervous because this is creating quite the vibe. Um, there's a story of a particular individual, his name is Joe Hill. Now, I doubt that most of you know of Joe Hill, but there was a song, if you remember uh, uh, Woodstock, the song, um, uh, I Dreamed I Saw Joe Hill Last Night, was sung by Joan Baez. But it's a song that uh, was sung years earlier, and Joe Hill, born in Sweden, jo Joseph Helmstrom, uh, was organizing workers, and he was framed on a murder charge in Utah, and he was uh, executed there, but he didn't want um, his body to be in Utah, and he didn't want his, he wanted his ashes scattered everywhere in, in the world except Utah. And they brought his body back to Chicago. The largest funeral ever in Chicago uh, was Joe Hill's funeral. 30,000 people showed up at the West Side Auditorium over where uh, um, Little Italy is on Taylor Street. And um, it's just amazing. It's a he had, first place he had his ashes scattered where the uh, scattered where the cemetery, Haymarket um, in Chicago, uh, or in Forest Park. Um, so I'm going to uh, move along a little bit here. 
the, I, this is Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. She's actually buried uh, right by the Haymarket Martyrs in, in uh, the cemetery in Forest Park, uh, which is, uh, um, and uh, 21 years old, she helped lead one of the most important strikes in America. She was a member of the IWW and changed the whole industry, the textile industry. It was called the Bread and Roses Strike. It was in Massachusetts in 1912. And um, uh, it no became known as the Bread and Roses Strike because they were not only uh, striking for bread, but they were striking for roses, which are the good things in life. Lawrence, Massachusetts changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of women who had, uh, were losing wages uh, through a change in law. This period of the early 1900s leading through World War I, though, is now a massive organizing time because uh, there's a, uh, a need for more workers. And in the stockyards in Chicago, it's a great story of how we transform society, but it took a long time. The story of the stockyards, where 125,000 people lived in the back of the yards, and uh, um, the conditions were incredibly horrible. But uh, um, uh, it becomes the story now, not just of immigrants, because it was all European immigrants working there, but by that period in 1915 to 1919, uh, a couple million African Americans come up from the South to work in the factories. And so now the struggles of, it used to be the Poles and the Lithuanians and the Irish and the Italians and the Slavs and the Croatians and would fight each other over uh, little pieces of the pie. But now it became uh, easy to target African Americans and keep people divided. And the story of change is always about solidarity and unity. But when you have people fighting each other, it's easy for the, as we would say, the ruling class to keep their uh, rule and to keep their wealth uh, intact. Um, and it's only in those moments when people would organize together, such as the bread and roses strike, such as the, uh, the Pullman strike, uh, the Homestead strike. This period in Chicago uh, is dynamic in many ways, but by 1919, um, on one hand, uh, union activists not born here are being deported, workers are being thrown in jail for the Sedition Act, and um, uh, Judge Landis, uh, who was a favored son of the uh, corporate elite, was made commissioner of baseball because he ruled against workers. And um, interesting story, and I will touch on more on civil rights, but Judge Landis, uh, he was, uh, he ruled baseball with an iron fist until 1944 when he died. And it was right after that, that Branch Rickey of the uh, uh, Dodgers said that um, uh, they should be trying to integrate baseball because all the great players in the Negro Leagues could be part of the national, um, uh, the major leagues. Um, but his, he was a true segregationist and believed in Jim Crow and I only relate this story because this is America's national pastime. He's commissioner of baseball because of his anti-labor rulings. The depression comes in 1929 and suddenly we have Americans one third out of work tramping across America, being evicted by the millions and nothing they can do but to organize or starve. And uh, this became what changed America for today, even though much of what we have, the middle class that we now have, has been uh, denigrated and disemboweled by um, low wages and uh, many other things. Uh, um, uh, the farming out, the sub uh, offshoring of America, uh, the deindustrialization of America. Um, this organizing by the millions forced uh, our government to sign a law called the National Labor Relations Act in 1935. And within a few years, it gave legal rights to organize unions and um, a more legal process towards collective bargaining. And millions of workers joined unions. And in a very short period of time, this country was transformed. Uh, and I'll show you a chart at the end of this that uh, many of things come out of that. But uh, it wasn't until uh, Roosevelt realized that these are the things he had to do, create a new deal, uh, that workers then began to see him as the president that they, they needed. Um, he was in for four terms. John L. Lewis, head of the coal miners, the United Mine Workers, 
he forms a new organization during that period in the 1930s called the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. And the CIO says to the AFL, if you're not going to organize people on an industry basis, instead of having, uh, you know, the, you know, 10 machinists in one place and the people do another job be in a union and another one, just organize all the auto workers in a union, organize all the steel workers in a union, organize all the textile workers in a union. And that's what started happening. And this transformed America. And suddenly, because we have the National Labor Relations Act, the law gives us the right to organize. And the president says this, could you imagine if our president said, if I went to work in a factory, the first thing I would be would, would is to join a union? Now, I know there are some people in this audience who will have their grievances against unions and or feel like, well, you, I'm in a union and never did anything for me. But the fact of the matter is that um, uh, the uh, ability to have people organized is what changes uh, it's where economic justice and social justice comes from on many different levels. And this is about leadership. And this is what Franklin Roosevelt supported. Um, much of the 30s and 40s was about workers taking to the streets and organizing. And we don't talk about this, but agricultural workers were organized. The Southern Farmer Tenant Workers Union, uh, led by people like E.B. McKinney, who went to Washington to uh, lobby for changes for uh, sharecroppers. This grew out of the New Deal. These are stories that we need to know more about, that it was possible to organize people on all bases. Look at equal pay for equal work in the 1940s. Yes, that was an issue back then. Um, Sit-down strikes. Um, the idea that unionism is an American right, that it's a democratic right, and frankly, most countries in the world, the right to belong to a union, the right to uh, collect the bargaining is seen as a basic fundamental democratic right. Um, in 1937 was a very incendiary year in American history um, where workers actually took over the factories. In Flint, Michigan, they sat down. They said, we're not gonna win on the streets. Let's just take over the factory and we'll sit in there in 44 days General Motors was organized and the whole community supported them. Um, in Chicago, an incredible event, also 1937, the uh, Memorial Day Massacre, where uh, 11 workers were shot in the back for pro trying to organize the steel industry. Um, uh, again, I'd just like you to know that when every COVID is over, we give tours of these places and we, uh, uh, share, um, I, go to our website and you can learn more about this. A story of America, I was talking about Pullman, but I didn't talk about at the time, the Pullman Porters, the United Sleeping Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters organized by A. Philip Randolph, who became a mentor of a, uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, the men who were treated literally as, uh, were subjugated and only could work for tips. When they got the right to organize the union and all African American union, uh, they became middle class. People like the Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall, a Supreme Court justice uh, who uh, argued the Brown versus Board education uh, case of desegregation in 1954. He was a Pullman porter. So once the porters were organized, it's a story of great civil rights. Um, and here you have A. Philip Randolph on the right, Martin Luther King in the middle. Um, and I'm going to come back to that story in a moment. World War II and women are in the workforce. Um, who, uh, how do you think uh, much of our defense of fighting fascism uh, was because women, of course, Rosie the Riveters were uh, building um, uh, the, de the defense uh, uh, industry. Um, just a little tidbit here. I, had, I periodically change slides. And I was, I used this slide to show how by the 1950s, unions had created an environment where uh, much, many, many people have, were developing a middle class lifestyle that we call today. But uh, if you notice the car, it's not exactly the early 50s there, is it? Um, so I just wanted to point out that if you're a stickler for these kinds of things, you can guess what year this is by looking at the uh, bumper of the car in the corner over there. and. Uh, um, uh, the headlights of this car. <laughs> uh, just a, uh, just the, the, uh, I just wanted to point that out because I noticed it myself recently. 
1954, the merger of the AFL-CIO creates the largest labor organization of America. And now we're entering a new phase in America when President Kennedy uh, becomes president in 1960. He signs legislation giving federal workers uh, some uh, union rights that they didn't have before. And uh, this is the beginning of where public sector employees, people who work for state, county, federal government, municipal government, uh, teachers have more rights and um, begins to, because they were not well paid, trust me, they did not have benefits and um, uh, they were left out of the uh, law that gave private sector workers the right to organize. Um, and here's another thing about history when we talk about labor. Martin Luther King, one, was mentored by a labor activist, A. Philip Randolph, who taught him about the sit-down strikes of the 1930s that transformed the civil rights movement to sit down for desegregation in the 1950s. And the March on Washington wasn't about just uh, uh, ending uh, um, discrimination. It was about jobs as well. It was a labor march, A. Philip Randolph. So Martin Luther King was very connected to the idea of the civil rights movement is inextricably linked to the labor movement. And in fact, as the president of the American Federation of State County Municipal Workers in 1968 um, with Martin Luther King, because where was Martin Luther King when he was shot? He was celebrating, he was protesting the Memphis sanitation workers, the black workers who belonged to AFSCME, uh, because two of them were killed in a garbage truck uh, and didn't have rights. And um, that strike uh, is where he spoke uh, and was assassinated. He was at uh, supporting the Memphis sanitation workers, the I am a man strike, as it was sometimes called. Um, you know, today is Mexican Independence Day, uh, but we had uh, the great uh, Mexican-American uh, leader Cesar Chavez in the 1960s, creating a new kind of civil rights for agricultural workers, the United Farm Workers, and Dolores Huerta, who also fought side by side with him, who doesn't get much mention in the history books, but um, uh, our uh, uh, um, uh, America would need if it wasn't for the laborers who pick our crops. And uh, uh, some of you may recall of the great great boycott of the 1960s and early 70s. Um, and interesting enough, with all the issues of the post office today, uh, back in 1970, when there was a huge strike of postal workers, that's what really started propelling public employees to have uh, gain collective bargaining rights. So today's workers, many, the majority of workers in unions are actually public employees. The biggest number of employees who are unionized are public employees. Um, and new kinds of workers were beginning uh, joining unions, um, uh, office workers, information workers. You know, you think about this, I'm going to tell a short little uh, story to, for you to think about this. Um, baseball, uh, you know, every major athlete uh, belongs to a union. The National uh, Baseball Players uh, Association, the, uh, the, na the major, I'm sorry, the, the Players Association, the Players Union, uh, was formed in the 1950s, but didn't get legal rights till the 1960s for collective bargaining. Um, and they hired a steelworker lawyer, uh, the lawyer from the Steelworkers Union, Marvin Miller, and he really helped change the whole face of what baseball was about. And you know, football, they're all in a union. Um, so uh, why are all the, so these are our actresses and actors. Why is it that people often say, oh, you don't need a union, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Talented people, they take care of themselves. We, unions are about mediocrity. Well, I find it ironic that the most unionized workforce are those who are the most talented people on earth, the athletes, the actors. They're the best of everything that they can be. They all want to be in a union. They all have a union, hockey, uh, sports, uh, entertainment, newscasters, they're 100% union. Isn't it interesting that we try to tell people that they don't need a union because it's about mediocrity, but the best and the brightest all know one thing, they need to be organized. And ironically, Ronald Reagan, who was head of the Screen Actors Guild, uh, uh, ended up getting money from GE to do commercials for them, and he gave up his union presidency uh, of the Screen Actors Guild, but eventually became president of the country. 
And I mentioned him because going in the 1980s, he fired all the air traffic controllers, which set the stage for today. And many of us would say that the firing of the air traffic controllers was a seminal moment in American history that created the opportunity for companies to uh, basically end the right to strike, which meant that workers no longer had power. And then such, everything was then moved to uh, uh, offshore. So the Maquilas in Mexico to uh, the Caribbean to uh, third world countries everywhere to produce the things that Americans produce. Now it's a much longer story and I've already run an hour. So I'm going to um, I'll move forward a little bit and just point out that all you have, this graph will tell you everything. All you have to do is look at the period of intense unionization from the 1930s to 1960 and pretty much way the, the gap. What I'm trying to share is that when union membership is high, income is distributed more evenly. And what we now know is that almost all income since the last 30 years goes to the top 10% and really the top 1%. That's where it goes. So working people are no longer sharing in the wealth because they're no longer organized. Now that's a whole other story and in questions and answers, we could talk more about that. Um, today's workers are of course fighting. The Las Vegas is a great story of an industry where when they organized Las Vegas in the 1990s, everybody developed a chance, whether they were in gaming or whether they uh, were the uh, um, service workers in the hotels. They had middle-class jobs, and that was a more modern example of an industry that changed uh, a whole uh, city, just uh, uh, economically. Um, all first responders are organized, and today the faces of people are look very different from the steel worker and the mill worker and the coal miner, um, healthcare, teachers, nurses, um, as uh, you know, 5,000 University of Illinois hospital workers are on strike as we speak. So um, the story of America continues to be about, you know, uh, uh, graduate students, um, about workers at different levels realizing that unless we stick together, unless we organize together, we will basically uh, um, not have the kinds of life that we should have. So um, I'm going to. Uh, uh, close this out. Uh, I could talk more about what's happening right now, maybe in questions and answers, but I'd like you to take a quick look at this because from the 1930s through union agitation, these are the kinds of things that we all benefit from. When 20, when 30 percent of people are organized, everybody benefits from it. Everybody, and that's the story of America. So um, let's hold hands and let's uh, uh, hope and let's act together that uh, when we do this, we can create the kind of society that we want to have. So I hope you go to IllinoisLaborHistory.org and check out our organization. And I look forward to talking to anybody that wants to uh, share a story or ask a question. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. That was great. Um, we do have a number of comments that have been um, people have been writing as we as you've been talking. I'm not sure if you can see those um, in the chat. I'm looking for chat right now. Let's see where's my chat. Where'd chat go? Um, questions and answers. I have this thing more. Oh, here it is. Here's chat. There we are. Okay. Um, do you want to? Uh, um, Should I just start reading down? Yeah, if you want to um, address anything. Some people just made comments as you went along. Okay, some people made comments and people can look at it. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any hard questions. That... Um, I'm just sort of looking through this. Does anybody have? Uh, will the recording of this call be made public? Where will it be? <laughs> so um, everyone will receive a link to the recording in the follow-up email. And then we're also going to be posting this on our Facebook, pa Facebook page and probably on our YouTube channel. But you will receive, if you re, uh, registered for this program, you will receive a link to the recording in the follow-up email. 
We have someone who says uh, she knows about 60% of the folks you've discussed. Good stuff. This will help the nurses I organize. Uh, thank you. Yeah, if um, sometimes I, when, I, when I do these presentations, this, this is a very broad presentation. Um, sometimes I'll focus on a particular period. Um, I, I feel like the present gets short shift in a lot of this because how do you tell the story of America in, in an hour? <laughs> um, maybe if I was, uh, uh, but I, I, I feel like I barely delve into, uh, I'd like, the, what I think is significant is to think about the people that we don't know about and why we don't know about, it. why aren't we taught about them and, uh, or these incredible events. Um, so uh, uh, what purpose does it serve for us to not know our history? And uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, that's a theme that I always like to keep alive. That's why I love talking about May Day where I grew up thinking May Day was a communist uh, plot, <laughs> a communist holiday. Um, well, because it was a holiday in the Soviet Union in China, because when I grew up during the Cold War, that was what the news showed me. I didn't know that it was about workers fighting for the eight hour day and that the workers were executed for exercising uh, the right to uh, um, organize and to protest uh, uh, brutality. So um, it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, we don't know this. It's amazing that we don't know who Mother Jones is or Lucy Parsons or Eugene Debs and how significant they were at a particular time in history. So, or that we learn about people and most uh, of uh, uh, people that think about Martin Luther King don't relate to that, don't even know that he was uh, assassinated uh, uh, while um, um, the, um, the night before, the famous I've been to the mountaintop speech was in Memphis to talk to the workers about their strike. Um, it, labor was fundamental to his uh, uh, organizing. So, yeah, so many things we didn't know about. Um, there is one question here. Someone wants, is wondering if you can share a suggested reading list. Okay. I will hold up some books <laughs> and you can, uh, can, you can uh, go to our website. You can, uh, we sell books. Uh, COVID had shut us down. We're at Roosevelt universities or where our office is. Um, this is the best book on mother Jones. Uh, can you see it? Are you mm -hmm. able to see it? Or does it come out backward? Oh, uh, we can see it. It's hard to read the title. Okay. So this is mother Jones, uh, the most dangerous woman in America by Elliot Gorn. Elliot Gorn. Um, um, just gen this is the best book on Haymarket. It's called Death in the Haymarket by James Green. Fundament it's a great read. It's a really a great story, an incredible story. Um, just it, 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 this is a fat book, but it's easy to read. It's called There is Power in the Union by Philip Dre. It's uh, we sell all these. Um, you can buy them on Ma Amazon, but I'd rather have you buy them from us. <laughs> Um, and um, uh, it's the epic story of labor in America. It's a good all around history uh, and easy to read. And of course, um, uh, when you go to Pullman to visit, uh, by our touring Pullman, our, one of our founders, uh, Bill Edelman wrote this, we're going to be updating it. It's a, you know, a walking tour. Um, he also wrote Haymarket Revisited. These are only published by us, so these aren't on the open market, but uh, um, it's a walking tour of all the places in Chicago related uh, map in the back related to um, Haymarket. Right now, during this period of COVID, I'm not doing group tours. I'm doing, I've done some small tours for people where I'll meet up with people. Um, uh, I would love you to learn about, uh, here's a book we recently published. There's so many, but uh, uh, a pamphlet on two important people. Uh, John Peter Alkel, the best governor we ever had. He's the one who pardoned the Haymarket Martyrs. And, uh, uh, and uh, it's a, an essay about him and Eugene Debs and their thinking about politics and uh, how they were alike and how they differed. Um, uh, so many more books, uh, but... Uh, um, I think if you go to our website, you'll be able to see a bunch of others. There's uh, books coming out all the time. There there are are a We're getting a bunch of questions. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of questions under Q&A and a couple under the chat. So um, 
we have, if May 1st is Labor Day, why do we celebrate ours in September? Good question. Um, well, I was just in uh, Pullman for Labor Day. We did a, uh, with the Chicago Federation of Labor and the National Park Service, a Labor Day celebration. So when I, I, you may recall that I was talking about in 1894 when the workers walked out of Pullman, it was another exam, it was a national strike because they shut down the railroad system. And there had um, been advocates uh, there had been advocacy for a Labor Day. And the first Labor Day parade was actually in 1882 in New York, but um, it was never really caught hold for an official holiday. But then when Haymarket came in 1886, um, when, they, when it was decided that, that let's make May Day, Labor Day all around the world, it kind of scared the ruling class because May Day represented a very radical, militant idea of uh, worker justice. And um, uh, with the strikes that were taking place in 1890s, um, the US uh, Congress wrote legislation. And after uh, the strike was settled, Grover Cleveland signed the act to have Labor Day be the first Monday in September. So that's how we got the first Monday in September. And it was many, many people believe it was a diversion to keep people from celebrating May Day because May Day was celebrated in the United States. There were big parades every year on May 1st, um, huge parades. So uh, people started uh, celebrating Labor Day on the first of September and it became more of a picnic holiday than it was a actual uh, recognition of labor. So that's All how right. it Great. Another um, comment. A year ago, the UAW strike against GM. UAW workers were getting a raise this year thanks to the four-year contract. During this pandemic, how many other workers are getting raises this year? Hashtag unions matter. Um, I, I, what, what, am I being asked how many people I are think getting raises? I think it's a, uh, a comment saying... Okay, yeah. Not many people are getting raises right now as we speak. They're, uh, so some people have raises because they have a multi-year contract. Those would be the people who, if, be, if you have a union contract and it's multi-year, um, there's a chance that you may have gotten a raise. Uh, state employees got a raise this year, although they went five years without a raise up until last year. So, um, and um, uh, so yeah, it's uh, uh, the only way, actually the whole issue of COVID and worker health and safety is becoming a, an issue. We're going to be celebrating our annual uh, Union Hall of Honor talking about uh, the pandemic and uh, workers, um, essential workers and occupational safety and health. Um, and um, the, what we do know is that the places where it's taken most seriously is where workers organize for uh, protective uh, um, PPEs and um, those kinds of things. And um, uh, it's, uh, uh, and this is going to be with us for a while. So uh, best, I think, to have representation during this time. We know that workers who have a union have much better chance of having protections on the job right now uh, with, so that they don't lose their job, so that they have uh, uh, ways to have family, uh, take care of their family. Um, their children, uh, when they have to be working at home or they're unemployed, there's a lot of things related to what uh, unions are doing uh, where they're represented. But unfortunately, other than the public sector, uh, most workers are no longer in a union. Uh, I do see another question, actually quite a few. Here's one. Today, manufacturing is being done all over the world. Do you feel that the union movement needs to be Again, supporting strikes and unions all over the world? Well, you're asking uh, uh, the right guy uh, to get that answer. Of course, yes, if that's what, may so um, I want you to think about what May Day is. May Day is International Labor Day. Um, there is a term, you know, it's a, a kind of a cliche among uh, certain people sometimes, uh, it, it, but it has a lot of meaning workers of the world unite. That goes back to the 19th century. The idea that if all workers in the world united, we could change the world for a better place. Um, 
today now it's more likely than ever because of communication in the small world and transportation, people actually talk to each other. And that's really kind of the purpose of our annual May Day celebration at Haymarket Square in Chicago, why we have an annual hosting, a dedication of a plaque from a labor organization somewhere else in the world. Um, the idea of international labor solidarity is uh, what can really fundamentally change everything. Um, of course, that sounds abstract, but, but uh, it unfortunately, the international relationships and labor aren't as strong as we would love them to be. But yes, for sure. Um, if uh, workers, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm not sure if they went on strike in Canada, um, but uh, the auto workers were going, calling for a, a nationwide auto strike in Canada. Imagine if all the auto workers in the United States also said, well, then we're going to go on strike. Sometimes the, the, the history of labor organize, of, of it, are these kind of uh, um, industry-wide strikes. Uh, you know, there was a strike in Seattle when, during the 1918 pandemic. It grew out of the pandemic. Um, it didn't last, but uh, it's another example of uh, um, uh, the big railroad strikes of the 1800s you know, that spread across America. You know, two years ago, you may recall, some of you may recall that teachers that did not have collective bargaining rights, but had a teacher unions were, uh, went to the state capitals in West Virginia, in Oklahoma, in Arizona, um, and somewhere else, I'm forgetting where else, uh, they got ra raises simply because they just in mass got together and went to the state capitol. Sometimes it works, often it does. Um, here's one that this question is not so much labor related directly, but more radical Chicago related. Is there any sort of memorial plaque, et cetera, for the Charles Kerr Publishing Company? So Charles Kerr Publishing Company, um, his uh, uh, Charles, uh, Franklin Rosemont, I forgot his father's name. Uh, I don't know about that. They merged with Haymarket Books, but they're a big part of our history. Charles Kerr Publishing Company was a book publisher that published a lot of uh, radical history and labor history and things like that. I have a few books here somewhere that are Charles Kerr. Um, his, uh, the Franklin Rosemont, uh, the, um, he was the sec, the son of, uh, I, I just blanked on the name of his father, but he's buried at, at the cemetery. Many people are buried in Forest Park around the Haymarket Martyrs. I actually, uh, gave words, uh, for when Franklin died, but he was the publisher for Charles Kerr. But after he died, Charles Kerr publisher went and merged with Haymarket. I'm, not sure I answered the question, but. Um, here's, here's one. Can you say a bit about the history of right to work laws and how they are bad for workers? <laughs> you got an hour? <laughs> so it's a good question. And again, most Americans wouldn't understand what that means. Um, right to work laws. So The, uh, when unions started developing power, uh, the John Birch Society, this is esoteric history, but uh, uh, I forgot the guy's name, started uh, creating a movement to try to end union rights. And uh, it seems like what I would call the right wing always seemed to come up with better names for things. So uh, they, formed an org, there are different organizations. There's the, the, uh, the uh, National uh, Defense, I, I'm, I'm blanking right now on some of the names, but the right, National Right to Work Committee is an organization with many offshoots that tries to um, say that workers should not be compelled to either pay union dues or in the public sector pay what's called their fair share. So when workers, are represented by a union, the union has the legal obligation to represent everybody. So in that area, so, um, so the union says, well, then you should be paying dues or you should be paying a fee since you benefit from the contract. And the right to work committees are trying to say, well, they shouldn't have to do that. That should be an individual choice. 
But uh, the problem is, is that that just basically keeps people divided and doesn't allow the union to effectively represent everybody because they can't get fee due. You can only operate as an organization if you have money. And um, that's what dues are for. You pay your dues. If you don't, so a lot of people in places where they have the right to, what's called right to work, we call it right to work for less. Um, uh, when they, people aren't members of the union, the union is weaker and the union doesn't bargain as well. The union doesn't, uh, isn't able to um, effectively wield power that it could otherwise uh, wield. So right to work uh, uh, laws um, are uh, the bane of uh, work, all working people's existence. Every American should be against that idea of what they call right to work, which is right to work for less which is to emasculate unions' ability to represent people. That's all it's about. And it's really a corporate uh, strategy um, because it's primarily, you know, the Koch brothers, the billionaires were big funders of that. All the, you know, the, the largest, uh, um, I will, I'm gonna just shift a little bit here, but because many of the people on this are from Illinois, you know, we're fighting for this thing called the fair tax. Now, all you have to do is know who's against the fair tax. Ken Griffin, billionaire. Every billionaire, except for Pritzker, who happens to be for it, he's governor, but different politics, it's the, the funding for ending the fair tax are the Chamber of Commerce, the, the, the wealthy, the elite, um, the idea of a graduated income tax. And so the same thing with right to work. When it comes to the democratization or the equitability of health, Education and welfare, the very wealthy are against it. And they often have front organizations to make it look like it's the average working person that is. So whenever you hear the word right to work, you're looking at people who actually would like to uh, continue to uh, not have to uh, share the wealth. Um, uh, so uh, in the wealth that is only made because people work for a living. The services are only provided because people provide the service. So yes, right to work is uh, uh, very bad for workers. Uh, we have two, uh, someone entered two questions. Is it true that if you are in a union, it is hard to get fired? Um, I don't know if you want me to ask the other one. Is it common for places with unions to use a person to do the work in the 90 day probation? then fire them before they are fully in the union? Well, let me answer the first question. The first question goes to the myth of um, uh, unions are bad because you can't fire anybody. Um, simply, absolutely untrue. All it does, so what, look, um, there are places that have rules and if, you're not, if you don't have a, con a collective bargaining agreement, you are what's called an employee at will which means unless you are protected constitutionally for certain things like um, uh, constitutionally protected things that are a guaranteed, you know, military status, uh, gender, race, things like that, uh, you can be fired for virtually any reason. Okay, so what does a union do? A union says, you have to have cause. <laughs> I worked for a union for 35 years. People were fired all the time were deserve to be fired. What we did was we gave, they were given a day in court. It's kind of like, you know, the death penalty, right? We don't want to see anybody get the death penalty that's innocent. We don't want to see anybody go to jail that's innocent. Um, so people should be able to have a day in court. There should be a procedure. It's all about having a procedure. If you work in a place they might say they have a procedure, but it's not enforceable. What a union contract does is it creates an enforceable procedure. So yeah, there are, so yeah, it can be more difficult because people have to follow the rules. And the biggest problem is that managers tend not to want to um, uh, do the work. So when there is an employee, so here's an example of something. Somebody's hired a, and they're probationary on a union contract might be six month probation, it might be 90 day, it might be six month, it might be one year. The employee is not performing and they're an employee at will while they're on probation, but the managers never do anything. 
They just don't do anything. They don't follow, they don't look at the paperwork. They don't counsel them. They don't say, hey, you're not doing a good job. Or and sometimes it's I'm they're busy, you know. So what happens? The employee passes probation, and now three years later, they've never been well trained. Uh, they don't do their job well, uh, and um, suddenly it's like. The, somebody saying, well, we should just fire them, but they got to have cause. They never bothered to deal with them before. Now they have to follow the rules. They didn't have to follow the rules when they were on probation. Now they got to follow the rules and it's a little harder when you have to follow the rules. Harder, that's a good thing. Um, so, but of course, nobody's, when they say you're protected, you're, you're, you're just being given um, uh, an opportunity to be able to, that cause has to be shown. That's really all it comes down to. So it's, to, in my mind, a big myth. I've done been this for decades, work in the, uh, where people were fired as long as uh, the rules were followed. Um, there was a second question related to this about probation. Um, is it common for places with unions to use a person to do the work for the 90 day probation and then fire them before they are fully in the union? I don't uh, think so. I mean, it's expensive to hire and fire people. Um, it makes more sense to train people. Um, so no, I, it, I, I would say that's not typical. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but uh, where there's a contract, because it doesn't serve any real purpose to say we're now going to hire somebody, but right before. What, uh, um, so I would say more often than not, that would not be the case. Uh, here's someone um, by the name of Rick. He's the president of AFSCME Local in Buffalo. Buffalo, New York. Um, I he says he's particularly interested in the organizing of public sector workers. Looks at, um, he said he takes a look at what Jerry Wirth used to do organizing and fears we will no longer, um, that we can no longer do that with, with a Supreme Court that is largely against our movement. Uh, thinks the Janus case didn't have the effect uh, that thought it would. Um, however, is worried there would be more cases coming down the pipeline that will affect more than the public sector. Are you aware of any of S C O T U S's radar? Scottus's radar? I, That's a long one. I know it's in Scotus, the Q and A. Let me see if I can find it and read it. Where Scotus. Yeah. Yeah, that's Supreme Court of the United States. That's Scotus. Um, gosh, I don't know if I see this question in the chat. Oh, it's in the Q and A. Yeah. Oh, Q and A. I see. That's a different thing, huh? Somehow it's not, I don't know where it is. I'm sorry. I can't see. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Q and A. I, I think, Rick, you're right that um, uh, the Supreme Court is, is uh, largely, uh, you know, Janice was a great example of, uh, I, that this is inside baseball stuff, and it's a lot to, for other people, I don't want to go into great detail about it, but it's basically, the Janice case was recent, it came out of Illinois, out of, from AFSCME, uh, where a Department of Human uh, Service worker uh, who was uh, supported by the Right to Work Committee was told you shouldn't have to pay your fair share or union fees. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled in, uh, essentially in favor of Janus. Um, however, um, while it has made it more difficult in some ways, overall, the public sector unions are really doing pretty well post Janus overall. It's different in different places. We're doing very well in Illinois. Um, I don't know about New York, but um, uh, but there are more cases coming down the pipeline. But they, actually, there was a good case today. I, I haven't even read it, that I, but that supports the union. Um, but yeah, the the uh, um, I'm not sure what else is. There are other cases on the Supreme Court's uh, 
that will be on the Supreme Court's radar. It's really on the Right to Work Committee's radar. They're filing cases all over the country under this current Supreme Court to try to destroy labor. That's in essence what it is. And, but it doesn't have to be that way. People can organize against it. I mean, law is law, but uh, laws change. Uh, you know, unjust laws can be changed. Um, and uh, Supreme Courts often change their view when there are mass movements. Um, that's what ha has happened time and time again. So I would always say that in the big picture, it's always about organizing. Um, uh, but yeah, in the near term, uh, unions are under huge attack, even though more than ever Americans support the idea of unions. In fact, most Americans now, 65% poll, say they wish they could have a union um, and uh, support unions. And most people don't even know that they could. They just don't know how to do it. But uh, uh, because it's uh, become such a legalistic thing with the right to work committees and anti-labor laws. I've said this before, that America is the, um, the uh, on a number of issues uh, among developed countries in the world where we have the weakest labor laws, that's just a fact. Um, and as a result, we uh, have uh, much more disparity uh, for working people in terms of uh, uh, in in inequality. And um, it's not like this in other developed countries, it just isn't. I mean, people have guaranteed health care, free education, child poverty isn't close to what it is here. Um, it, uh, it could go on and on. It's, uh, you just go to your neighbors in Canada. It's a similar country. It's hard to tell the difference between the two, except they have a lot better safety net for working people. You might have just addressed this, but um, someone asked, why was there never a union formed for software developers? Well, the software developers have to decide to form one. You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's hard to, or, you know, it's, you can't just say, oh, well, we're going to create a software developer union from the outside. People have to uh, want to do something. And um, as a result, you know, everybody that's rich and powerful has a union. The, the, so if you're a lawyer, you belong to the American Bar Association, the Chicago Bar Association, the Cook County Bar Association. If you're a doctor, you belong to about 16 different associations. An association is a union. It does the same kinds of things, except collective bargaining is another layer for the right to bargain wages. But uh, you're lobbying, you're changing laws. And so everybody that has the so software developers, in fact, I think that the there's a nascent in Silicon Valley, um, there seems to be a movement towards this kind of advocacy. Um, some of it's taking on some of the big issues like uh, climate change, uh, uh, where, you know, thousands and thousands of Google workers and uh, Amazon workers are supporting, you know, petitioning for issues. Of course, that doesn't go to the heart of the profits of the company uh, right now. So uh, that's when the company decides once you say you want to have an actual union, they're going to fight you. It's just inevitable. Um, but uh, that's uh, um, the people have been through this in history and uh, the 1930s taught us what can happen to change the society when people decide they'll just do it because they felt like they had no other choice. And software developers, you know, are probably need a union as much as anybody. Well, Larry, there's so many, com you know, just general comments. Thank you. Great session. Uh, here's someone, 65% of people support unions and wish they could join. We better get organizing. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Spivak. <laughs> yeah, I, um, uh, uh, well, uh, maybe I'll do this for some more library systems and uh, more people can hear the story. There aren't enough of us telling the story. And this is stuff that you almost have to be a graduate student or uh, um, uh, to, to get this information. So, uh, and you don't have to be, but it's just not, uh, um, uh, that's why our organization exists. I'm in the midst of forming National Alliance of Labor History Societies around the country. Uh, we're getting close to it. So, uh, cause there are organizations like ours all throughout the country. Um, 
Uh, but ours is the, probably the most esteemed because of being the preserver, the, the uh, uh, caretaker of Haymarket, which is the world's most sacred labor monument. So it gives us a little more uh, um, cachet, I guess you could say. And of course, Illinois history is just so rich um, for worker history. Well, Larry, I agree with you. You definitely should do this for other libraries. This is an excellent presentation. We have someone who's asking, can we contact you? Yes, <laughs> Ellen, uh, I late. So um, uh, the um, again, if you just go to IllinoisLaborHistory.org, but our uh, um, uh, email is. I wish I had it. I don't know why I don't have it up here. I labor history s i l a b o r history s at gmail and I'll get the email that way. Um, and uh, um, that's probably one of the best ways uh, to get a hold of me. Well, you have such diehard fans here that um, pretty much everyone, uh, except a few people who had to drop off, stayed here. So thank you everyone for this very for staying for this very long but um, extremely important yeah. informative presentation. Thank you, Larry, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Great. Well, thank you. I want to thank the Tinley Park Library in particular for hosting this. Well, you're very welcome. <laughs> thank you for uh, for reaching out to us. Um, and anytime you want to come back and talk more, we would love to have you. Okay. So take care and stay safe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good night, everyone. <laughs>